in the name of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Your capacity to distinguish right from wrong, your moral compass, your conscience, were you born with it or did you acquire it? Yale University in 2010 conducted an experiment. Imagine this. They took three-month-old babies, with mom's permission, I'm sure, and sat them down for a show. And the show was this. They took little wooden figures. And one of those little wooden figures was a character trying to climb, struggling, to climb up a hill. And there were other little wooden figures who sought to hinder that little character's progress. And there were other little characters who sought to help that little character struggling to get up the hill. They found that three-month-old babies favored focusing attention on all the characters helping to help, serving to help. Same researchers used 13-month-old babies, a little advanced over the three-month-year-olds, three-month-year-olds, can you say that? No, three-month-olds. The 13-month-old babies were there also to witness one of the researchers taking crackers and distributing them to two other researchers fairly and unfairly. And the researcher who was acting fairly, the 13-month-olds were much more inclined to associate with that researcher and ignore the other. In Japan, at the Toshogu Shrine in Nikko, Japan, there is the home of the three monkeys. See, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. No one's certain for sure the origin of those three monkeys. They're Japanese macaque monkeys common in Japan. And no one also is very sure exactly what they mean. The best interpretation is drawn from a Buddhist proverb that basically says we would do well to just not allow evil thoughts to enter our lives, to remain committed to a path by which we are not contaminated by those. Just a more common interpretation, which sadly, but probably accurately, is a criticism upon us all, is that we do not wish to hear, see, or have anything to do with moral responsibility that we're inclined to turn a blind eye to anything that happens across our path that is considered immoral. So my question is if, as I believe, thank you three-month-old babies, that there is within us a evolved predisposition toward moral goodness, that the question arises, where along the line do we decide to turn 
a blind eye to instances in our life where something clearly wrong is going on. How do we begin to betray that moral compass? Why would we betray that instinct within us? And what's the cost of it? It may be that happiness, as we acquire, may I say, that understanding from our culture, happiness is the pursuit and acquisition of comfort and status and wealth. Not that that in itself is a bad thing, but we've been led to believe, we've acquired this notion that if we focus on that and make it to the top of the hill, regardless of what cost it may have on others, we will be happy. Henry David Thoreau watched this happen in his day, and he spoke in those wonderful, familiar lines, wonderful in kind of a haunting way, of all the people he could see from his retreat who were leading lives of quiet desperation. And even though on the, on the, on the surface, these people who had, most of us, I dare say, not these people, I hate to say that, you people, most of us, probably found somewhere along the way reason, I'm sure there's a list of reasons, for turning a blind eye in our pursuit to get up that hill, turning a blind eye on ourselves and others. And even though we present as though we did get to the top of the hill and we're enjoying all of this happiness, those words of Henry David Thoreau are biting and I do sense under the surface a quiet desperation. This gospel is a nightmare. It is. It's a nightmare. It's the kind of nightmare we, you know, what is a nightmare but waking up and going, oh my God, I'm glad that was not real. A nightmare is being in a, in a place where it's bad and there is no mercy coming our way. And so the rich man, as this sort of morality play is unfolding, seeps, you know, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so succinct. You get this image of someone who quite blithely is getting on with his life, probably not even necessarily a bad guy, but he is, you know, in his wealth, in his security, in his comfort, his element of criticism is indifference. Not wealth, but indifference. There's this gentleman just outside his gate, and he just, is it conscious, turning a blind eye? Regardless, the story ends, this chapter, and it begins again in the next life, and positions are reversed, and there's a chasm, and that chasm cannot be crossed, and it's bad for Mr. Former Comfortable, Wealthy, Rich Guy. By the way, and I hope I don't lose my track by saying this, Charles Dickens took this story and played it out, you'll recall. He did, in his story, send back someone from the dead, Marley. And Marley showed up with Scrooge, Scrooge the rich man who feasted sumptuously, and it's the story. And Scrooge is probably happy that maybe Father Abraham figured out a way to get that Marley across the chasm, because Scrooge got the full message and repented. And now I've got to get back. <laughs> Thank you. 
I think that we, we, again, we and they, let's not do it, go there, but that good, let's say good-hearted people, Christians, we hope, good-hearted people are not in the practice of instilling fear to change someone's behavior. That's our reputation, sadly. I don't buy that. So yes, this story is nightmarish, and it's supposed to say, hey, wake up. Care about that person out there by outside your door. Or the next life, whoa. Does it, does, it, does it move you? So rather than doing that, how about dangling a carrot? A really, and if you're not into carrots, sushi, something. <laughs> Dangle something that, that moves you forward and opens your eyes to, oh my God, what am I missing? What am I missing here? And that's where Marcus Aurelius, of all people, come in to play. He was that Roman emperor, Stoic philosopher, whose words to this day, he lived like 190 to 210, some, I mean, years ago. But here is a sample of this brilliance and profoundly faithful man not Christian, faithful. If every, I think I get this right. If you, how did this go? Hang on now. If you give yourself if you move, that's it, move. And I like the movement thing. Think about that, movement. If you move, if you move and offer an unselfish action, with every movement, with every example, no, I wish I could get this exactly as he said it, but it's basically this, that if you move, every unselfish action repeated in your life again and again, every unselfish action with God in mind, only there, only there, delight and stillness. Every action, unselfish, every one, again and again, only there, delight and stillness. There are three other monkeys that you don't know about. Not these monkeys that close their ears and their eyes and their mouth. But there are three other monkeys, I didn't know this, three other monkeys, opposite. They take their hands and they cup their ears. And they take their hands and they focus their eyes. And they take their hands and cup their mouths so that they can speak out in favor of what they stand for. And that takes courage, and it involves risk, and the temptation to turn away, give a blind eye is there. But provided you keep those ears open and your eyes open, and you're willing to act and speak up, you will be able, at the end of the day, at the end of your life, put your head upon that pillow, and within seconds, you will fall asleep 
with a clear conscience, with, with delight, amidst stillness, knowing that there are several <laughs> three-month-old babies who are looking your way, grateful that you have been helpful and not a hindrance to those among us who are struggling to get to the top of the hill. <laughs>